Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, good afternoon everyone. We're delighted to have Luigi Adario Berry tell us about probabilistic aspects of minimum spanning trees. Thanks very much, Yuval. Thanks for the invitation. Um, so, uh, I'm starting with this picture because it's a nice picture that's somewhat related to the subject of my talk. Um, and so, since there was some interest, maybe I'll tell you quickly just what this is. Um, so, here we have uh, 100,000 uniformly random points in the unit square. Uh, we formed their minimum spanning tree. And uh, say again, the minimum spanning tree according to Euclidean distance, yeah. And we've picked some random root vertex, which is somewhere around here. I guess if I have a laser, I can do that from further away. And then colored all the vertices according to their graph distance in the minimum spanning tree from that root vertex. So the closest vertices are red, and then orange, yellow, green, blue, purple, violet um, codes uh, graph distance in the tree from that root. And you see all these interesting curves start to appear. So this How is a... Pick the How did you pick the root? Uniformly at random. Uniformly at random. Yeah. So, so, so this, is a, this is a picture that um, no one can say anything about to date. Um, if, if we'd used some um, version of this on the triangular lattice, then the people to ask um, <coughs> would be uh, Christophe Garbon, Gabor Pette, and Ode Schramm, who have a f forthcoming paper on the subject. The black, uh, the black lines so and, and the black lines, so, so the problem is that there's so many points here uh -huh. that you can't see the, uh, the, m most of the edges of this tree, only the colors. So what I've done is drawn the important edges. And what important means is that, um, so an edge is drawn in bold here. If on either side of that edge lies at least 3% um, of the tree. So if the edge cuts at least 3,000 vertices off from the rest of the graph. OK, so it gives you some idea of the broad, broadly of the structure of the, of the tree. OK. But I won't be talking about two dimensions today. Uh, this is just sort of a motivational picture. Um, I'll be talking about uh, minimum spanning trees in high dimensions. Uh, so just a very, very brief reminder of what they are and how we build them. So if you trace back a bit, you find all well, the earliest reference that uh, I've been able to find is um, Dura Borufka. And he asked the question in the following sort of general form. So you're given um, the complete graph. So n, n points with distinct edge weights, which we think of as distances between the points. And you're interested in forming a, a network, so buying a network, which is the unique connected graph that minimizes the total length. Okay? So you want to connect up all of the cities, and you, don't want, you want to pave a minimum number of miles of road. Okay, so um, we've, we've chosen all the edge weights to be distinct so that, we so that there's a unique minimizer. That minimizer is necessarily a tree. You're never going to buy a cycle uh, if all you care about is a minimal connectivity. Um, and this is the minimum spanning tree. OK, so the, one of the standard, there's many easy algorithms for building these things. One of the things I like about this problem is that it's algorithmically very simple, but probabilistically quite challenging. Uh, so um, here's one of the methods, sort of simple greedy method, often called Kruskal's algorithm. It's really essentially. Um, from this earlier paper. It just says order the edges of your network by increasing order of weight. Then consider the edges one, one at a time in that, in that order and add each edge unless doing so would create a cycle. So we're always going to add the smallest weight edge in this example. Okay, second smallest is three. We add it. Don't add six because it would create a cycle. Add seven. And now we're already connected. We know we're not going to add any more. Don't add eight or nine. Okay, and so this is quite standard. I'm going over it quickly, but I want to emphasize one thing about this process, okay, which is the following. Anytime we 
decide not to add an edge, that's because it would create a cycle, which means its endpoints are already in the same component. Okay, so that means that if at every step, if we're only interested in the connectivity that has been formed by the edges that we've added, okay, so which, at a given stage, which pairs of vertices are now connected up by some path, it doesn't matter whether we add all the edges or only the edges that this procedure adds. Okay, so let's just convince ourselves of that quite quickly. Um, here we add an edge, add an edge. The third edge we don't add, right? But if we did add it, we wouldn't gain any new connectivity. There was already a path between those vertices. Okay, and so on. Here we add an edge. And now any edge that we, the last two edges we don't add, but we, that doesn't change the connectivity. Okay, so, so this gives you a coupling between two processes. One where you only add edges that don't create cycles, and one where you add all the edges. And that coupling is going to be basic for this talk. So it's, I hope it's clear to all. Okay. So what's, um, so, 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 say that again? That is not Burukas, that's Kruskos, right? But th this really is Kruskos, but I mean, in essence, it, in essence, it's Burukas algorithm. Okay, Krusko, um, Krusko really says one at a time, but Burufka, say, Burufka more or less says do some greedy procedure with possibly larger clumps than single vertices. Okay, so it's, I think, I mean, I would, I would give the credit for this to Burufka. But, what Burufka does is every vertex chooses its minimum cost edge. And then you certainly select all of those in your tree. They could be the same edge on a different one. Right. So, so yeah, so then, then, well, and it's not individual vertices, right? It's, it's, it's components. It's every component. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, it's, it's essentially, it's essentially this, a sort of global greedy procedure. It's, it's slightly different from Crystal, you're right, but it's... Okay, so, um, so you can think of various probabilistic models that you might impose if you wanted to understand the sort of typical structure of these. I showed you one at the start. Given the sort of, um, the, the description of the problem, I just um, gave you a natural probabilistic model. It would just be to say, instead pick IID weight. IID weights or lengths, okay? And so that gives you sort of two different um, probabilistic structures, one broadly Euclidean, one broadly IID or mean field, okay? And then there's, there's, there's course, so that, that's sort of one axis of division that you can look at for, for um, research into um, minimum spanning trees from a probabilistic perspective. Another is um, whether you study things that actually have to do with the weights themselves or you study the structure, the sort of, metric or graph structure of the object that you build. Okay, and there's a lot of research in both of those camps. Um, so on the weight um, functionals, so, so maybe the most famous classical result in this subject is that the, um, the total weight of the minimum spanning tree, if you use independent uniform weights on the complete graph, converges to zeta of three. So this is a famous result due to Ellen Fries. Okay, but there's a lot more research in a similar direction Okay. Um, on the other hand, if you want to study the global structure, then there's, there's also a huge body of work and there's all sorts of questions you can ask. Um, one natural f probabilistic framework for asking those questions is to try to study some sort of distributional convergence of your finite objects to some limit object, which might be um, an infinite volume limit a la global weak convergence, or it might be some compact limit, something to do with, um, with curves in the plane if you're s in a Euclidean setting. Or there's a, there's a variety of, uh, of possibilities and a lot of um, work on the subject, including by people in this room. Okay, so um, I've mostly been focused on trying to understand the, um, the IID picture and the metric structure. Okay, and so there's a variety of ways you can do that. You can ask for, for local structure, sort of global structure, which you might get at by, by rescaling your tree to f sort of maintain a compact object as n gets large, um, or you might try some other things. Okay. Um, so another question you can ask is how, you know, it, it, if we manage to understand one object, in, to, to what degree is it a template for other objects? So if we can handle one sort of some sorts of weights, can we handle other weights, or can we handle minimum spanning trees of other graphs, and so on. Okay, so that's, I'll call that the question of universality. Today I'm really going to focus on, um, on talking about global structure. 
Okay, global structure for IID edge weights. Okay. And let me just quickly um, uh, make one observation uh, that comes from the algorithm I just described. Okay, if I, if I take the complete graph on n vertices and, and I want to, form, to, to, to understand the metric structure of the minimum spanning tree, then as long as I use IID weights with some continuous distribution, it doesn't matter what the weights are. Why is that? Well, the, the, the algorithm I just described starts by ordering the edges in increasing order of weight. And as long as you have IID continuous edge weights, then that's, that's just starting from a uniformly random permutation of the edges. Okay, and, and, and once you have that permutation, everything else about the procedure is determined. So the distributional properties of the tree, if you don't care about the weights themselves, only rely on this fact. So you're really free to choose the weights you want. We're going to end up choosing uniform 0, 1 weights to get a nice coupling. Okay, so here's, um, here's a, a description of the global structure of this tree. So if you take the, the minimum spanning tree, which I'll call Tn, so this is a random tree, and rescale it so that each edge has length n to the minus one third and mass one over n, so the total mass of the object is, is one, and you call this rescaled metric space, measured metric space Mn, then for some suitable notion of convergence and distribution, Mn converges in distribution to some random limiting metric space. Okay? So there's sort of, to, to, to fully explain this theorem, I need to tell you sort of a few things, what this notion of convergence and distribution is. Um, there's sort of some work to make sense of what exactly this is telling you. For today, I'd like to just focus on one thing about this theorem, uh, which is this rescaling here, the fact that the edges should be rescaled by n to the minus a third so that the limiting object is compact. Okay. And, and so that statement is really uh, equivalent to this statement, um, that if you look at the diameter of the minimum spanning tree of the complete graph with these IID continuous edge weights, then that diameter is of order n to the one third. So if you want to get a compact non-degenerate limit, you should rescale by n to the one third. So, so, so this is, this is um, some older work. Um, I should mention who's, uh, who I'm um, working with on this slide. Uh, Nicolas Brutin, Christina Goldschmidt, and Grégory Mermont. And um, this theorem, which I'm going to focus on, is um, joint work with Nicolas Brutin and Bruce Reed. OK, so any questions about the, the result? So there was a conference paper where we described the results and the journal version appeared in 2009. We proved it in 2006 and we proved it again in 2009. <laughs> <laughs> ah, that was another possibility. <laughs> Independently and simultaneously. Um, okay, so here's our setup. We're going to have the complete graph. I said, now I'm making a choice for my edge weights, uniform IID uniform 0, 1 edge weights. Okay. And remember I, the, the, the point I made a minute ago, which is that in the, in the process where you add the edges one at a time, if you're only concerned about the connectivity structure, the set of components, the set of ver the, the vertices of each component, it doesn't matter whether you add all the edges or just, a sub, or, or just the, the tree edges. Okay. And that provides us probabilistically now with the coupling um, with the classical Irish Renyi random graph GNP. So I'll remind you that the Irish Renyi graph process uses these uniform 0, 1 edge weights, and then for a parameter p between 0 and 1, you only keep the edges of weight at most p. Okay? And then every edge in the resulting graph, every edge is independently present with probability p. Okay? And we can do the same thing for the tree, just throw away all the edges of the tree with weight bigger than p. Okay, that gives us some forest in general, right? Because we've taken a tree and thrown away some edges. And the point is that the connected components of the forest are exactly the same as the connected components of the tree. Yeah? Okay, so if we want to understand the global structure of this tree, 
then the time at which that global structure, if we view the, the, the p as a time parameter, then the time at which that global structure forms will be the same time at which the sort of, at which g and p becomes hooked up into, into one connected graph. Okay? So in particular, it's classical that the connectivity threshold for GNP is at log n over n. P is log n over n. So we certainly don't need to go past log n over n to understand the final minimum span entry Tn. But in fact, okay, m the, the bulk of the structure is formed much earlier, around P is 1 over n. Okay, and I'll, I'll make that precise. So I, I'm writing everything that interesting occurs when P is around 1 over n. So, so here's a comic sketch of, of what I mean. If you look just at just a bit less than 1 over n, at 0.99 over n, then all the, com all the connected components of GNP have logarithmic size. Okay? And so that will also be true for the tree. So if we're trying to build something of size of order n to the third, which you can at least believe, you know, I'm going to convince you of that, but if that is indeed the case, then nothing really interesting has formed, nothing really substantial has formed on that scale at this time. On the other hand, if we go just a bit past 1 over n, then, then there's already a unique component of linear size, and all the other components have logarithmic size. Okay? So you can somehow imagine that if all the other components have at most logarithmic size, then plausibly they're not going to affect the diameter of the final tree very much, even after they hook on to, uh, to, to that largest component. Right? We know at this time then there's, there's going to be a, a component of this forest of linear size, and all these logarithmic little pieces plausibly won't change things very much. I'll try, I'll, I'll try to convince you of that. But, but this comic picture should at least uh, motivate why we want to study what's happening around p is equal to 1 over n. This is really the time at which uh, the structure of the MST is going to be built. Okay. So I'm about to focus in on what's happening around p equals 1 over n and describe to you how we're going to understand the structure of t and p at that time. Uh, before I do that, I just want to make sure that this, this picture is clear. So this, this, this is already an important thing to understand. right? When we're just below 1 over n, we have components of logarithmic size. Just above, we have one component of linear size, all the others are logarithmic. Let's look at what happens in the, um, at that. Uh, um, at that breakpoint, 1 over n. Okay, so it turns out that at this point, the components of gn 1 over n are pretty tree-like. Okay, this is good news for us if we're trying to understand the minimum spanning tree by some sort of comparison with this graph process. That in fact, the graph process is, built, is building us things that are already pretty close to being trees. If you look at the largest number of edges, the largest number of edges more than a tree that any of these components has. Okay, that's some random quantity, but it stays bounded in probability as n gets large. In other words, that's a, it forms a tight sequence of random variables. That's in fact, I mean, there's a, there's a, 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 the expectation stays bounded of the largest number of cycles. Okay, so that's good, and, and most of them in fact are already trees. Okay, so a component of GNP that happens to be a tree is also exactly a component of TNP, right? It's the same set of vertices. It must be the same set of edges if it's just a tree. OK. So how big are these things, and what's their diameter? Well, it turns out that they have size around n to the 2 thirds. OK, this was, this was already um, asserted in the um, classical 1960 paper of Erdős and Renyi on the subject, maybe 1959. Okay, but the, the fact that, that at, at 1 over n, the size should be around n to the 2 thirds is, is, is certainly a classical result. And more importantly for this talk, the diameter of these components, of these largest components, is around n to the 1 third. Okay? What is P of um, P? So it means that um, if you give me an epsilon, I can give you k such that the probability it's at least n to the two-thirds over k, and at most k n to the two-thirds is, is at least 1 minus epsilon. So, so, so you can bound it in an interval, a, a multiplicative inter interval around n to the two-thirds with probability as close to 1 as you like. Yeah. So it means in probability, it doesn't mean the parameter p. 
No. So thanks. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm going to, I mean, basically everything I say in the talk will hold in the sense of improbability and also in expectation. And I'm going to sort of gloss that because everything, in fact, happens with very high probability. So um, for the most part, I won't be too careful about that. But feel free to ask if, if, uh, if something's unclear. OK, so I'll, I'll, I'll sort of try to justify this diameter n to the 1 third to you. OK, but let me remark before I do so that this already yields a lower bound on the diameter of the resulting tree. Okay, because if I take a component of the graph and it has diameter n to the one third, well, the tree has, the, we know that the, 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 the forest has that same component, right? And so the, the tree that spans, the minimum spanning tree of that component, well, what does it do? It takes all of the edges of the graph and then it removes some of them. That can only increase the diameter. So that component of the tree must also have diameter at least n to the 1 third. And on the other hand, that, that bit of tree is some subtree of the final minimum spanning tree. So the minimum spanning tree must have diameter at least n to the third. OK, so this immediately yields the lower bound. OK, I said that already. Um, let me um, now explain where the n to the 1 third comes from. So let's suppose, right, here's, here's the vertices 1 up to n, right? And let's suppose you give me some particular set of vertices s, and you tell me that s is a component of gn1 over n, OK? Well, we know that it's pretty tree-like. I said it, it, it has sort of a at most a few edges more than a tree, and it has a decent chance of actually being a tree. Okay, so suppose, so we're supposing S is a component of G n1 over n, and let's suppose that it actually is a tree. Okay. Then the symmetry of the model tells you any spanning tree of that set of vertices is equally likely to appear under that conditioning, right? So, so we know it's a tree. Which tree is it? Well, any, for any particular tree to occur, that gives you m minus 1 edges that have to occur, and the rest of the edges have to not occur, plus no edges to the complement. That means for any tree, you're conditioning on the same number of, you're asking for the same number of edges and non-edges, and so any tree is equally likely. OK, so if I tell you that the component is a tree, it's a uniformly random spanning tree of its set of vertices. And uniform spanning trees, if I give you a uniformly random spanning tree of m vertices, that's, that's, that's the same as a uniformly random tree on m vertices. That, and it has diameter root m, right? That's, that's classical. OK, so, so then the diameter, that's probably too low to see. But it's written on the slide as well. Right? Diameter root m. Here, m is equal to n to the 2 thirds. Take the square root, you get n to the 1 third. That's where the n to the 1 third comes from. OK? And, that's, and, and I, that's true. That's literally true if it happens to be a tree. If it has a few more edges than, than a tree, then its distribution is not too different from what you'd get if it really was a tree. Okay, that takes a little bit of thought, but it's pretty straightforward. Can we give the thing the or? It's a tree with probability, um, yeah, you bound it away from 0 as n tends to infinity. So that at least explains the lower bound plus some idea of where the scaling comes into the one third comes from if you already believe this. OK, so for an upper bound, we have to do some more work, right? We have, now we have, we said we have some components of this size, right? And any given one of those components is going to have diameter into the one third already. To get an upper bound, we need to say that after all those components hook up and all the smaller components hook up, that the diameter doesn't get too much bigger than this n to the 1 third. So we need to understand how these components are going to connect together. OK. So the sort of fundamental idea for how we do that is, 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 a, is a straightforward deterministic lemma that I'll tell you in a second. Before I tell it to you, since we've, we've already started talking about um, 
the structure of the critical random graph, I'd like to say a little bit more about that, because now we're going to start increasing the value of p. I told you what this looks like at p exactly 1 over n. Okay? And on the other hand, my comic, what I call the comic slide, said that once we're at 1.01 over n, we've sort of already determined the global structure. So we need to understand what's going on for p between 1 over n and 1.01 over n, okay? which is called the barely supercritical phase. And the following uh, is a picture of that. So let's look at gn1 plus epsilon over n. Yeah, epsilon small. And order the components by size. Then here's the picture. If epsilon is small enough, then you can think of epsilon as being 0. We're really at the critical phase. And small enough turns out to mean n to the minus a third. Okay. So if epsilon is this small, then, then, then we're back on the picture of the previous page. All the components have size around n to the two-thirds and diameter around n to the one-third. Okay, the largest components have, have those properties. Okay. You, can, you can easily convince yourself that this value of epsilon is at least plausible because if you take two components of size n to the two-thirds, then there's n to the four-thirds non-edges between them. And once one of those non-edges comes along and becomes an edge, they'll hook up and form a bigger component. So the characteristic time on which two of the sort of largest components will hook up is around 1 over n to the 4 thirds. And that's precisely what you get by plugging n to the minus 1 third over n in there. OK, so this is, a, this is, this is reasonable. OK, once you get much bigger than n to the minus 1 third, but still smaller than n, the picture is sort of in a way, much more uniform. Okay, it always looks. Um, here we had sort of two lines to say that this is, you know, more or less up to constant factors. Once epsilon is much bigger than n to the minus one third, a giant component, a unique largest component, is already forming that has size around two epsilon n. Okay, and it turns out this is sort of more recent, but um, also sort of well-studied and well-known uh, facts. The second largest component has size asymptotically 2 over epsilon squared log epsilon cubed n. Okay? And, this, and so, so we don't, I'm not saying anything about the diameter of this one, but it is classically known that the second largest component has this size, and the second largest diameter, which might not be the diameter of the second largest component, yeah, the, the, the largest diameter outside of this giant guy over here is, uh, is of order 1 over epsilon log epsilon cubed n. OK, so these, these, you don't have to worry too much about these logs. They disappear when epsilon is n to the minus a third. And for the purposes of this talk, you're not going to be um, in bad shape if you uh, pretend they're not there and just treat this as 1 over epsilon squared and diameter 1 over epsilon. Okay? So you can think of that kind of picture. I'll come back to some of this again in a minute when I need it. But, it, but it's, it's good at least to have seen it, right? Okay, so here's the deterministic lemma that I promised. Okay, that's going to tell us how to understand how these components hook up. Okay? The picture. that's worth drawing for you is that rather than just looking at all the connections as they form, we're going to do the following thing. We're going to treat the largest component of the growing uh, tree as special. Okay? And we're going to look at how it increases in size and diameter in stages. So first we'll increase p a little bit and see what new connections form that are not to this component, so that, that are between other components. Okay? And then once we've raised p a little bit and seen some new connections come in over here, we'll look at how those new components connect to this graph. Okay? So that's, that's the rough picture, and that's the picture you should have in mind when I tell you this, this um, lemma. Okay, so I've, I'm defining some quantity, which is just the, 
uh, it's LP for longest path, the largest number of vertices on any path in a, in a connected graph. Okay, that's, that's certainly an upper bound on the diameter. Yeah, and it's essentially equal to the diameter if we're talking about trees. The diameter is usually in terms of edges, which is the reason for that minus one. Okay, so if I take, if, if I take some fixed graph G, yeah, and two subgraphs of G, but one bigger than the other, okay? So I have two subgraphs and then spanning trees of each of those graphs. This is, the situ this is the situation I have with my coupling between G and P and T and P, right? I've got increase in graphs, that's G and P, and spanning trees of those graphs. And I say, what's the diameter of T prime in terms of T? Well, an upper bound is whatever diameter I started with plus twice the length of any, the, the longest length of any path outside of that tree. Okay, so let me, this is, this is, this is, quite obvious when you draw the picture, it's just saying that you had some spanning tree of, of H, right? You, now you have a spanning tree of H prime. How much could the diameter have grown? Well, at most, there's, you take some path here, some path here, right? And any path in T prime can be decomposed in this way into some portion that's in, uh, in H prime, and then a path in H, and then another path in H prime. The, the fact that it's a tree guarantees you that, that you, can't have, uh, you, you can't have more bits than this. Okay, so that means that, that, that gives you this upper bound immediately. This twice the longest path is just the length, an upper bound on the length of these two paths, and this is an upper bound on the length of the middle bit. Okay. Is that, is that clear? Okay, so how are we going to apply that? Um, so let's go back to, um, to our coupling and order the components by size, just like I said before, right? Then this tells us that if, if, when, if when we increase from P to P prime, for some values P and P prime, if, what, if which component is the largest hasn't changed, Right? Then we can apply the lemma to immediately to get an upper bound of this form. Okay? We've got the, the new diameter is at most the old diameter plus twice the longest path from out here. Right? And now you can understand where, why I was caring about the diameters of those, those small components. It's because they're going to come in as some sort of a bound on this quantity. Okay? So I'll keep that. Um, so now I want to explain um, in a little more detail that um, picture of the, what's happening in the barely supercritical range that I just gave to you. Okay, and this is um, there. There are sort of a variety of references you could cite. One appropriate reference is, um, is I mean, much of the work in this area is due to Thomas Wittrak in the um, early to mid '90s. Um, the, the, the particular result that I'm saying here is, in, is essentially from a paper of 1994. So in this range that we were interested in, okay, the largest component has size 2 epsilon n. And if you remove that component, okay, then what's left essentially looks like a subcritical random graph on the remaining vertices. Okay, so here the parameter was 1 plus epsilon over n. After removing the largest component, what's left looks like uh, a random graph with parameter 1 minus epsilon over however many vertices are left. Okay? So if, this, if, if, if we just remove, I'd, I'd like to explain this a tiny bit. If, if rather than removing the largest component, I just removed some fixed set of k vertices, well, the independence of the model tells me exactly what the distribution of the rest is. It's distributed like g n minus k p, right? And if you want to write p in this form, then now you have to use something over n minus k instead of something over n, okay? So if you just write, rewrite p in terms of n prime, you get, one, you get essentially 1 minus epsilon instead of 1 plus epsilon when this is the number of vertices that you remove, okay? So that's, um, 
the content of this is really that even, so this would be true if we removed some deterministic set of vertices, and it's still true even if you remove a ran, this particular random set of vertices. Okay? Good. The nice thing about this is that that tells us that if we look at, if we remove the largest component, we ha what we have is essentially a subcritical random graph. So we can even increase p a little bit on what's left, and we'll still have a subcritical random graph, right? So in particular, if I take p prime to be 1 minus alpha p, okay, then what's outside of the giant component now is going to look like a random graph on the remaining vertices with this parameter, 1 minus alpha times what we had before. Okay, and in particular, if I take alpha small enough that I'm still subcritical, right? So alpha small enough that, that 1 plus alpha times 1 minus epsilon is still less than 1 minus epsilon over 2, okay? Then I can apply the preceding, ba the, the earlier bounds on the length of the longest path outside the giant that, I, that came from that picture. Okay, so the point, the, the, again, What this is saying is, here we're already at the point where, so this, this was my comic sketch, right? We're already at the point where there's one big guy. Out here, we know the largest diameter was around 1 over epsilon with some logarithmic correction that I told you not to worry about. And that will be true even after we do the thing that I described, which is scatter a few extra edges out here, okay? And these edges come precisely from increasing the parameter from p to 1 plus alpha times p. Okay? So even after you scatter those, the diameter is still small. Still of the, you get a bound of the same order. Okay? Good. Okay, well that more or less is, is all we need, in fact. Okay, and here's why. So let me just, this, this is really the key point. So let me, let me keep it for a second. Okay. So here's what we're going to do. We'll start, we know what's going on at 1 over n, right? I described to you that's how we got our lower bound. We know what's going on at 1 over n. We even know what's going on at 1 over n if we add in a little bit, okay, of this form. And, you know, if, to, to, be, to be careful you need to care about how this lambda changes things, but you'll have to believe me that even if I pick some large fixed lambda, the diameter is still only n to the one third, okay? And that's not that you can prove using classical facts. Okay, so we'll start from here, and then we'll start increasing the value of p in this way that I described. We'll add some edges out here, see how they connect to the largest component. Add some more edges, see how they connect to the largest component, and we'll do that in a geometric way, okay? So I'll, this is this is my starting point epsilon zero. And then I'll just let epsilon i be 1 plus alpha to the i times epsilon 0. Okay, so each time I multiply epsilon by 1 plus alpha to get the next one. Okay. And I'll keep doing that almost all the way up through the critical window. Okay, so I'm thinking when I say lambda large, I'm, I, I want you to think of that as saying large enough that we can start pretending that this picture is really the correct picture, that there's one large component and all the rest are sort of moderately well behaved. And that holds until we get almost to epsilon equals 1. It's, on, it's only really epsilon equals little o of 1. But, if, but let's pretend sort of that 1 over lambda, this large lambda, is a proxy for small. So we can continue until we get almost up to 1.01. .01. Our new 1.01 .01 is 1 plus 1 over lambda. Okay? So what happens, this, this fact in blue up here, plus the bound from the corollary on the diameter outside tells you that when you go from stage i to stage i plus 1, the diameter increases at most this quantity with the value epsilon i that we just wrote. Okay? Which, as I said, if you want, you can pretend it's just 1 over epsilon i. Okay, good, because we know what we start with, and we know what the difference is at each step, right? And I've just rewritten that using the value of epsilon. It's n to the 1 third. And if you keep track of the log, you get i over 1 plus alpha to the i. Okay? 
So just sum over the whole range, this, is, this, this sum is dominated by some geometric sum, right? And so even if we sum to infinity these, these terms, we get something bounded. And so that gets us all, almost all the way through the critical window, and we still haven't lost more than an extra factor n to the one-third in the diameter. So the diameter may have increased by a constant, maybe even a large constant factor, but not by anything more. Okay. Great. So, so I mean, th this, if, if, you, if you believe this, it should already convince you that n to the one-third is the right answer, because we said that at time 1.01, Right, one plus one over lambda. All the other components are already logarithmic, so they shouldn't. It'd be surprising if they had any very large effect on the on the diameter. But let me really prove that to you as well. What yeah. Is it alpha here? Is it, is it the so no, no, no. I mean, alpha. I, I think I think you can take alpha as equal to five quarters, for example. It's really some. All you need is that each time. Oh, you mean one plus alpha equals five quarters? Uh, I mean, alpha is, is a quarter. Yeah. So. So remember. Didn't you have an equality like one plus alpha times one? I had one plus alpha times one, um, times one minus epsilon is less than one minus uh, epsilon over two. So. Um, Doesn't that say that uh, alpha should be like epsilon? Uh, oh, so sorry. So that was, that was, this is what I meant. So, um, um, So here we have, um, so we have a random graph with p is around one minus epsilon over n, right? And so we can afford one minus epsilon over two over n, yeah. So, um, so I can take alpha, yeah. Um, I can take alpha like epsilon over two. Um, and so let me let me write this. Um, Say that again. Let me write this as 1 plus um, p is 1 over n plus lambda over n to the 4 thirds. OK, then, um, then to get from, um, Yeah, so I can, so, so that's fine. So, I can, so, so epsilon is, um, so, so, I, so I can take epsilon like lambda over 2 over n to the 4 thirds at the, um, so, so I, can, I, can, I, can incre I can increase, right, from, from 1 minus lambda over n to the 4 thirds to 1 minus n minus lambda over 2 n to the four thirds in the first step. Yeah? And when I do that, the, the parameter p increases, right? So p prime then is like 1 plus 5 lambda over 4, 1 over n plus 5 lambda over 4 over n to the four thirds. 
right? Okay. So, we're still choosing alpha to be epsilon over 2. Right. And then this multiplies the end of lambda 1 over epsilon. So, So, so the, I mean, the, the point is that epsilon needs to, to geometrically increase, right? Epsilon needs to geometrically increase so that this sum can geometrically decrease. So I, so I may have misparameterized uh, alpha in this statement, but the point, but, but even if alpha is epsilon over 2, right, then we, we, still, get an, we still get a geometric uh, increase in the parameter epsilon i if we add these, uh, if we add these epsilon over twos at each step, right? So, so, so then, so, so then epsilon i plus one is really epsilon i times one plus So, so, so it doesn't seem, I don't see how it can work the way you wrote it with one plus alpha to the i because then the alpha has to be too small and you multiply by this. Or so maybe I'm missing something. Yeah. But if you basically are choosing each time your alpha to be the current epsilon over two, yes. Then only the first few alphas are small. Yes. And then and, then, they, then, they, and they grow and geometrically. Then, and then, and then, <coughs> then it's not. Then it's not this formula. Because here you seem to have fixed alpha. Yeah. No. You're. You're correct. So that 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 came from hastily preparing the slides and not looking at my old paper. But no, you're right. So, so this so, so alpha needs to be small when epsilon is small. But if you take alpha, I mean, in the first step, epsilon gets a constant factor bigger than you can take a alpha a constant factor bigger. Right. And the point is that then these, I mean, the, the key point is that these epsilon i, if you do that, if you start with, with if alpha i then is of the form constant greater than 1 to the i divided by <coughs> n to the 4 thirds, right? Then, these, then the corresponding epsilon i are still de decreasing geometrically quickly. Yeah. And so the, 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 the epsilon inverse are decreasing geometrically quickly. It's a little confusing. So, so. So now you want, instead of alpha, you want alpha i. Yes. Okay. yes. So how do you define the epsilon i? So I just want to solve this cyclic uh, definition. So, so let's alpha i should be roughly epsilon i over here. Let's take alpha i equals five quarters, five quarters to the i okay. alpha i. Let's, let's. So the epsilon is to increase geometrically. It's just to make the screen. So, so I think this is fine. But then what's the moment of epsilon in terms of alpha? I mean, what? Um, I mean, no, alpha. then, then is each... Is um, it still true that epsilon i plus 1 is alpha i times epsilon i? Epsilon i plus 1, one, one is, plus. is 1 plus alpha i times epsilon i. So, but, so that means that the true. epsilon i's are growing like exponentially in i squared. Oh, no, no I see, because of the one plus. I see. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so sorry for the confusion. This problem, but is the is the picture now clear? So, so let's um, let's go on from here, though. I mean, so so we we can essentially uh, repeat the same idea, right? starting now from the barely supercritical phase to go all the way up to the threshold for connectivity. Okay? So now, right, we want to go, for example, from 1 plus 1 over, 1 over n plus 1 over lambda n to 1 over n plus 5 quarters over lambda n, right? And that increase in the parameter, the duality principle still tells us that what, what is outside of the largest component looks like a subcritical random graph with parameter 
1, 1 over n prime minus alpha over n prime. Okay, and the, and the point is that once, uh, once epsilon is of, of the order 1 is not much smaller than 1, okay, the sort of 1 plus epsilon, 1 minus epsilon dichotomy can't literally be true because for epsilon greater than 1, it, it's sort of trivially obviously false. Okay, but there's still a duality between the supercritical, bet, between the supercritical graph and some subcritical random graph after you remove the largest component. Okay, and in that subcritical random graph, all the components will have logarithmic size even after you increase the parameter a little bit okay, by some constant factor. And so now, starting from 1 over lambda n, we only need to, to increase the, the parameter by a constant factor logarithmically many times to get all the way to 1. Okay? So even if at each step in what's left, we, um, we, we do the worst thing, which is increase the diameter by an additive factor log n, at the end we've only increased things by at most log squared n. Okay? So, I mean, you, you can in fact write these two arguments, in the, these two steps in a unified way. Um, I mean, in both parts, you're, 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 you're just applying this diameter bound for a judiciously chosen sequence of increasing sequence of probabilities. Okay, but sort of conceptually things look a little different when you're in this critical window and when you're above the critical window, so I prefer to present it like that. Okay, um, so uh, I think that's all I have prepared for today. Thank you. Is the diameter, uh, like suppose I allow you to look at a tree which is double the cost of the minimum spanning tree. Yeah. Can the diameter go very small for such a tree? Yeah, I think that you can, you can get log or even log log n if you're willing to spend a tiny bit more. And I think there's some work on that. No, you should know, yes. David. I think I already know it. There may, there may even be a, a, a poster about it upstairs. There's a poster next office. Yes. <laughs> that was a planted question. Yes. You've subliminally absorbed it. <laughs> How did you do the embedding of a plane? So the... Right this one? <laughs> so, so this is this is like spring electrical embedding. I think it's called spring electrical embedding. It's uh, some Mathematica package. The, the the one on the first slide is just uniform points in the plane. This one is really a minimum span tree of the complete graph, with some embedding in the plane. So the colors the colors in this picture represent edge weights. So all the black edges have weight at most one over n, and then again colors this time colors code the weights of edges starting from red and increasing to violet. And the so. edges have the appropriate lengths as well. The edges do not have the appropriate lengths. The edges have lengths given oh, by some embedding yeah. of the complete graph okay. of the minimum span the complete graph, graph into the plane. Okay. Yeah. Did all the springs are the same? Uh, you'd have to ask Matt that. Do you also have concentration of the diameter around uh, and to, to the to third? So you, you one third. Oh, one, one, two, one third. So you won't have, I don't expect you'd have anything too good on the lower tail, though I'd have to think about it. So what do you mean by, I mean, there's no specific constant in front of the end. I mean, we, right, we, that's the we can, sh we can show in, no, we, I mean, we can show in a, in a, we, in a different paper that, in fact, the diameter divided by n to the one third converges in distribution and that the limiting random variable has a density. So it's uh, it's not a it's not a point mass. But it can uh, what, what what's the limit of the distribution? Is it something something very com complicated? It, yeah, I mean it's it's we don't find an explicit formula for it or anything. Yeah, that was when the period of the tails. I expect that if you worked, you could get some sort of um, at least exponential and possibly Gaussian upper tail bounds. Um, so, um, we didn't explicitly state those, but I expect you could. I expect you could at least extract exponential tails from. Them. So I mean the the diam The point is that th these, you know, everything, 
everything that th this the qu one of the one question for answering that is how um, what sort of tail bounds do you have on the diameter the largest diameter outside of the largest component and there you can get quite strong bounds which I believe are Gaussian so then you need to understand how these how these increments contribute to some final bound but I mean I expect with some work you could again get a, a Gaussian tail bound out of that the maximum degree. I'm not sure. There. Tight but or? No, I don't expect it to be tight. It's the maximum degree. Yeah. Look what you mean. Like, yeah. That's the trick. Yeah. Um. But like, what do you? What is the conjecture? You say something. So, right. I don't think, because there's, there's. I mean, there's some, there's some explicit formula for the degree of the root, which comes from some mixture of Poisson distributions. Okay, and, and and you should essentially have independence between different parts of the tree. So a guess based on that is that it should be like log n over log log n. Um, but I haven't proved that. Yeah. Okay, I think we'll continue this.